Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so as a group, uh, on, on this quiz, I guess for the undergraduates, uh, it was a little bit harder, I guess. Um, graduate students seem to be, have, have done better in this, on this quiz compared to the second one. But anyway, um, average is still reasonably, it's, it's a low, I guess that's a B. Uh, but you know, if, I'm happy to meet with any of you individually if you'd like to discuss, and if you have any questions about how I graded uh, the exam problems, especially the qualitative explanations. So I just want to clarify one thing. When I say like no equations, I mean like, okay, if, if you say the, okay, the current, right, the forward current, how does that change with doping? Um, if you just say, okay, it's inversely proportional to doping, and if the doping decreases, so the current increases. That's kind of the same as math. I mean, right, that's still the same as using an equation. Y if you say an equation in words, that's, that's really not what I'm looking for. I'm looking for a little bit you know, more of an intuitive understanding of what's going on. So I, I tried to be a little bit lenient there. Um, so I, I think of the quizzes as a chance for you to learn from, you know, just to make sure you understand the material. Um, the grading probably will be a little bit more strict on the final exam. But for the quizzes, I'm trying to be a little bit more lenient because I know you're in, still in the process of learning the material. Okay? So it's intended to encourage you to learn the material um, from a fun fundamental understanding rather than just memorizing equations. Yes, Lewis. Quiz four. <laughs> uh, quiz four will be on the, mainly the MOS capacitor. Yeah, they'll, they'll just be on the MOS capacitor. We'll keep it simple. Um, in terms of the length of the quiz, did you think it was okay? Did anybody run out of time this time? Okay, all right, great. Okay, yeah, so yeah, the quiz is, like I said, just try to encourage you to keep up and um, learn the material, okay? Okay, so last time, okay, so today we'll finish the basics of the MOS capacitor and specifically looking at capacitance, formulas for capacitance. But just to review, um, we're just gonna continue looking at uh, NMOS MOS capacitor. In other words, um, the substrate, the silicon will be P-type, okay? So the three regimes, one is accumulation, where the surface is accumulated of majority carriers, um, I just wanted to clarify because a good question came up last time. Okay, so why do we, you know, strictly speaking, why do we assume that um, the, the total amount of energy band bending in the silicon really is nearly zero under accumulation and then later under inversion? Okay, so remember that the, the separation between the Fermi level and the valence band edge, um, the concentration of holes depends exponentially on that separation. So as we increase the gate voltage above the flat band voltage, or sorry, if we decrease the gate voltage below the flat band voltage, um, we're gonna attract more holes to the surface uh, because they're positively charged mobile carriers. Um, but we're increasing the gate voltage sort of linearly, okay? So the amount of holes that you need to introduce um, at the surface is just linearly increasing with the, as you decrease the gate voltage. And so e, EV minus EF, or EF minus EV, um, that's, not, that's only gonna change logarithmically, so it's not gonna change very much. So that's why we can say, okay, the, the firm, once you have a relatively high concentration of holes at the surface, the Fermi level and the valence band edge are not going to move too much, or actually the, val the energy band bending is not gonna change too much to move EV even closer to EF you know, for, for a reasonable range of gate voltages, okay? So the same thing, we make the same assumption once inversion is reached, Okay, so once we actually apply a, po a positive gate voltage that's enough to drive away ho uh, holes, to deplete the surface of holes, and actually start to form an n-type material, um, once the surface becomes strongly n-type, you don't really need to move the, firm, uh, move the band edge, the conduction band edge, close, much closer to the Fermi level to have the electron concentration increase linearly as you increase the gate voltage above the threshold. Okay, so again, Above threshold, we can assume that um, the total energy band bending in the silicon is not gonna change much, it's not gonna increase much beyond two phi f. Okay, so it is an approximation, but it's a reasonable one, okay? So under inversion, sorry, in the inversion, strong inversion regime, this is for, for n-type, oh sorry, for n-MOS, so in other words, for a p-type semiconductor, this means that it's Vg is greater than uh, the threshold voltage. Uh, so 
as we put more positive voltage on the gate, that means we have more positive charge on the gate. We have to in have some equal amount of in increase in negative charge in the silicon. And that negative charge, if there's an adequate supply, will just come from more mobile electrons. And so electrons negatively charged, since they're mobile, they can be attracted to the oxide interface. So the uh, electrons that are mobile mm -hmm. will be gathered in the silicon at the interface, at the oxide interface. Now the, depletion, the depletion charge, of course, those are immobile ionized dopants that are just fixed in the lattice, right? They're uh, covalently bonded to silicon atoms. So the, the ionized acceptors are not going to move towards the <laughs> silicon oxide interface. They're just going to stay you know, in, at a certain concentration in the silicon. So this will be minus Q Na. So to get a certain uh, amount of charge per unit area, you have to deplete some, some depth here, the depletion depth. And the depletion depth ideally would not increase beyond the depth, the, the depletion width at threshold. Right, that, remember that the width of the depletion region is just that that's needed to drop the total, the, the voltage drop in the silicon. And if the voltage drop in the silicon never goes significantly beyond, beyond 2 phi f, then the depletion width will not widen beyond this expression here. Okay, so remember this equation here that the voltage that you apply to the gate is going to be shared between the silicon and the oxide, and then there's a built-in voltage, that, the flat band voltage that you cancel out. And so um, above threshold, you have this amount of band bending, 2 phi f in the silicon. Uh, so that's the voltage drop in the silicon. And then in the, in the oxide, you have to take the total amount of charge on each side of the oxide layer. So that's gonna be the depletion charge, and uh, in addition, any inversion uh, electron charge. So this is the mobile this is mobile charge, and this is sort of fixed charge. But in any case, both of them are negative charges that contribute to the total amount of charge in the silicon. And so from Gauss's law, the electric field in the, semi in the oxide really just depends on the total amount of charge on either side of the oxide. And um, and you have to uh, divide by the, you multiply by the thickness of the oxide to get the voltage drop across the oxide. So you end up with the voltage across the oxide is equal to the, q, the charge in the silicon divided by the oxide capacitance. So this is in coulombs per centimeter squared, and this is farads per centimeter squared. Okay, so remember, C ox is just equal to permittivity of oxide divided by the thickness of the oxide. Okay, so if we know that the depletion charge is not going to increase much more beyond the, um, the depletion charge at threshold, right, because we're not bending the bands anymore in the silicon beyond threshold, then this is the same depletion charge at threshold. So we can basically write an equation for it, right? It's 2 phi f here. And so this is the threshold voltage right there. And the only, um, so as you increase the gate voltage beyond the threshold voltage, what you're doing is you're just inducing more and more electron, mobile electron charge at the interface in the silicon. And that extra electron charge is going to cause an extra voltage drop across the oxide. So that's basically what this equation states. Just beyond threshold, all you're doing is you're increasing the voltage drop across the oxide, not across the silicon. So remember um, Q equals CV for any oxide, but now it's the, uh, sorry, the oxide capacitance in inversion. And the V is VG above threshold. Okay, so ideally, this is just an approximation. When the gate voltage equals the threshold voltage, we'll say that the inversion charge um, is negligible. Um, what that means really is that if we plot the charge density in the silicon as a function of distance, uh, let's say that this is, oh, sorry, negative charge. The silicon is negative charge, like this. And um, let's say that's the maximum depletion depth. What we're saying is that at threshold, okay, I'm gonna draw, okay, so this is, this is Q, all this area here is the depletion charge. If we integrate all that area, that's depletion charge coulombs per centimeter squared. And 
And if we draw the electron charge density at, at the surface, um, this would be Q inversion. Okay. So what we're saying is that at threshold, the concentration of electrons at the surface is equal to the concentration of, you know, to, to the, the p-type dopant concentration. Okay. And so um, the total integrated charge, uh, you know, Q sub Q inversion, is n sm much smaller than Q depletion at the threshold. So, so this equation sort of assumes that you know, Q inversion is zero at threshold. Um, and we know that's not really the case, but the, it's just approximate. It's an approximation. Just Q inversion is small or negligible compared to Q depletion. That's all that this equation is saying. Okay, are we? Okay, so the question is, how does the energy band bending really change? Okay, so if we increase above the threshold, then, uh, well, where is the Fermi? Okay, so look how, <laughs> the, the conduction band edge here at the surface is already pretty much like right at the Fermi level, um, which means that you have a degenerate lead, you know, a, a degenerate concentration of electrons right at the surface. So, um, so the answer to your question, as you increase the gate voltage, let's say linearly, let's say by one volt above the gate, uh, above the threshold voltage, you'll induce some amount of charge at the surface. Okay, so typically an inversion layer, the typical concentration might be 10 to the 19 per centimeter cube to 10 to the 20. It depends on the gate voltage, how much you increase the gate voltage above the threshold voltage. But the local concentration of electrons at the surface, when you form an inversion layer, can go up to like 10 to the 19 per centimeter cube. Okay. Yeah. So as as you increase the gate voltage, so you're you're like pulling this d further down on the left, um, you're going to have more voltage dropped across the oxide. So it'll look like this, and you'll have a teeny tiny t bit more band bending in the silicon. But like I said, this this band bending doesn't have to change too much. I mean, if it changes by a little bit. Uh, the, the electron concentration of the surface is increasing by a lot, right? Because there's exponential dependence on electron concentration of the surface um, on, on E, C minus E, F, right? So if you bring E, C closer to E, F by just a tiny bit, then you'll increase the, you know, exp exponentially the concentration of electrons at the surface. Does that make sense? So, so basically, in order to just Conversely, if, if you want to just increase the concentration of electrons at the surface, like by 10 times, you only need to decrease EC minus EF by 60 millivolts, so e, 60 milli electron volts. And so that's relatively a small amount of increased band bending compared to 2 phi F. That's, that's all that, that's the approximation we're making. Okay, uh, was there a question, Andrew? So the question is, how, how much, is there a limit as to how much charge you can induce in the silicon at the surface? Uh, <laughs> in, in practice, uh, yes, because, um, so, okay, so Q equals CV, and uh, there's also something called the uh, electric field, right? So electric field is going to be equal to Q in the silicon, total electric, uh, total charge in the silicon which is Q depletion plus Q inversion over um, the permittivity of the dielectric. Okay, so this is electric field. And so in practice, um, there's a, a maximum electric field that any material can withstand before it'll start being, it won't be a good in insulator anymore. You just get breakdown like tunneling or physically, depending on how thick the oxide is, it can actually break down. Like it can, you can have like damage to the oxide. So uh, typically, the breakdown field for an oxide, um, silicon dioxide, is is actually about 10 megavolts. It's more than 10 megavolts, like 15 megavolts per centimeter. Okay, so um, you can calculate. So yeah, there's in practice, you you can't increase the voltage too much to to be in danger of breaking down the oxide. Then it won't act as a proper insulator for your 
integrated circuit device. But the charge densities can, can be pretty high, like I said, up to maybe 10 to the 20 per centimeter cube concentration right at the interface before it starts to really break down. Okay. Okay, so just to summarize, if we look at the total amount of band bending in the silicon, uh, we're approximating that in accumulation there's negligible band bending because the, uh, the Fermi level is already pretty close to the valence band edge. You don't need to bring it too much closer to get lots of holes at the surface. So this is an approximation here in accumulation. And as you increase the, so you, once you reach flat band, then you can start to deplete the surface of holes. And so then you'll have some voltage dropped across the silicon um, as well as the oxide. Okay, so the part that's dropped, the part of the applied gate voltage that's dropped across the silicon will increase. We sort of derived this kind of messy looking expression uh, last time. But it looks, it, it kind of looks like um, sub, sub, sublinear kind of increase. As you increase the, the gate voltage, you'll increase the voltage dropped across the silicon. And it actually depends on the oxide thickness through the C ox term. So the thicker the oxide, the less you're going to be able to drop to, to induce a voltage drop across the silicon because more of the voltage will be dropped across the oxide. So you actually want um, thin oxide. Is that right? You want th well, yeah. You, normally you want thin oxide to drop less voltage across the oxide and more voltage across um, the silicon in order to induce inversion. So this is two phi f. Once you reach 2 phi f, then you form an inversion layer at the surface. You don't need to increase the band bending too much more to get lots more electrons at the surface. So we approximate it to be flat here and to be flat here. But in reality, of course, it's not perfectly flat. Okay. Pardon me? Oh, phi f. So phi f, if we, oh, okay. I didn't have to draw that. I'm not drawing this to scale. So let's say the intrinsic Fermi level is near mid-gap. So the definition of phi f, okay, so this is p-type silicon. So the Fermi level is in the lower half of the band gap. This is the definition of phi f. I think that's q phi f, right? Right, yeah, phi f was, is uh, in volts. So the, the larger phi f is, that means the more p-type your substrate is. And in other, in other words, it takes more gate voltage, more band bending in the silicon to change the, the surface from p-type to n-type. Right? The, the more heavily doped p-type your, your, your substrate is, the more, more band bending or more voltage you need to apply to change it at the surface to n-type. Okay. Yes, Andrew? Ah, okay. <laughs> so what would happen if you have you start out with degenerately doped p-type? You never have that. Okay, let's see. What would? Okay, so what's your question? Like, can we invert it? It's. Um. Okay. Okay. We usually <laughs> we don't see that in practice, but let's see. Uh, why wouldn't you be able to invert it? You still can drive away. Um, you can still put applying a positive voltage above the flat band voltage to the gate, you can still de um, drive away the holes. They're mobile, they're positively charged. If you put positive charge on the gate, they'll still go away, leaving depletion region. But yeah, the, the threshold voltage would just be really high. Right, so um, in this slide here, notice, okay, we end, Professor Hu ends it at 10 to the 18. Actually today, we're, we're are, we are going to silicon doping concentrations above 10 to the 18. Uh, for reasons we'll cover later uh, when we talk about transistors. Um, so doping as high as 10 to 18, that's almost degenerate, borderline degenerate. Um, and so as you can see, the, the threshold voltage, looking at these light blue curves, the threshold voltage does, especially if you have um, a relatively thick oxide, threshold voltage does increase more steeply as you go to higher and higher doping concentrations. So you just need a, a larger voltage to form an inversion layer. Um, and usually we don't like to have a high voltage operation for integrated circuits because it takes more power and, yeah. Okay, good questions. Okay, um, and then the, uh, the depletion width, 
It's just the, you know, the thickness of the depletion region that is needed to drop the voltage. So basically, this whole curve here is just the square root 2 epsilon silicon times phi s. Okay, and then ph and phi s reaches a maximum of 2 phi f at the end. Okay, so. Okay, so the, okay, so why do we care about the depletion width? Because this gives us, uh, so um, this will give us, oops, Q depletion, right? So if we know that the width of the depletion region width, uh, of the depletion region as a function of the gate voltage, then we can t calculate Q depletion as a function of the gate voltage, okay? And so I think that's like, Right here, yeah. <coughs> okay, so this is a summary. So it's a, it's a little bit maybe confusing, but on the left, we plot the accumulation charge per unit area as a function of gate voltage. And then the middle plot shows the, the depletion charge. Okay, so this is due to ionized acceptors when you deplete the surface. So the middle plot shows Q depletion as a function of gate voltage. And the, the bottom-most plot plots the inversion layer charge density as a function of gate voltage. Okay, so at the top, you only have an accumulation layer of, of holes wait a sec, uh, when you have a gate voltage that is more negative than the flat band voltage. So you can attract holes to the surface. Um, and so the, the more you make the gate voltage negative, the more holes you attract to the surface. So it's just a linear function like this. But above the flat band voltage, you're not going to be accumulating any more holes. So the accumulation charge density per unit area is just going to be zero above the flat band voltage. Uh, the depletion, you're not going to deplete the surface unless you're applying a positive gate voltage above the flat band. And then the maximum that you deplete is um, basically uh, given by the the depletion depth needed to in induce band bending of 2 phi f. Okay, so it reaches a maximum. So the Q depletion will be negative in, in magnitude, but it's going to reach a maximum magnitude at threshold. And then the inversion charge, as I mentioned, is an approximation. We will assume that it starts at zero as the threshold voltage, and it will increase linearly um, above the threshold voltage. So then the total charge in the silicon, in the, in the semiconductor, is, can come from uh, the positive holes, right? accumulation charge density, the depletion charge density, so this is less than zero, less than zero, this is greater than zero, for p-type silicon. Um, you just add them all together. So you end up with this curve of the total charge in the silicon as a function of the gate voltage. Okay. So just to remind you, the Q depletion here, okay, let me just change colors. This is holes. What does this charge do to? Yeah, ionized acceptors, very good. And this charge, okay, this charge here is due to electrons, right? So, yeah, different sources of charge can exist in the silicon depending on the bias condition. Okay, any questions just about charge versus gate voltage in an MOS system? Okay. So that's where we continue. So now we take the derivative of that curve and we find th that gives us the capacitance, right? So capacitance, so this is really um, small signal capacitance. In other words, it's um, the change in Q equals CV. Yeah, change in charge. Right, it's the ratio of the change in charge for a given change in voltage applied to your gate. Okay, so that's what we mean by small signal. It's just it's not Q over V. It's the change in Q the ratio of the change in Q over the change in V. Okay. All right, so the way we me measure this in, in practice is by applying a sort of a, well, we call it maybe a large signal. So let's say 
VG. So we, we ramp this slowly. I increase it at like 0.1 volts per second. You know. So we apply a DC voltage and change it or just step it systematically. Um, so we start actually usually, I we probably start in, in inversion and step it down um, to flat band and, and to below that. Okay, so this is all done within a, an instrument called a CV or LCR meter. Um, L for inductor, C for capacitance, and R for resistance. But there's some kind of instrument where you can actually set the starting and, and ending voltage to sweep, and it automatically provides a small AC signal. So on it's typically less than 50 millivolts amplitude. Okay, so it's just a very small, that's what we call small signal. So it's a very small, you know, AC, like a sine wave, sinusoidal waveform. Okay, so it's just changing with time. And then it's going to determine what the, and it's going to measure the displacement current that results from that AC voltage. So basically the CV meter uses this equation to determine the capacitance as a function. Okay, so this, the CV meter gives you capacitance as a function of this gate voltage. Okay, so that's basically, we're going to derive some simple equations for the capacitance as a function, uh, basically it for different regimes, the accumulation regime, depletion regime, and the uh, inversion regime. Okay? So as I'm, uh, I guess this indicated here, is just the change in the total charge in the silicon as for a given change in the gate voltage. Okay, so we have this curve, and Basically, you just take this derivative, right? It's just the change in the sil um, or it's just magnitude, right? This is VG, and this is this whole plot plots QS. Okay, so it's the magnitude. So hopefully, if you look at the slope of the charge versus voltage on the left, you can see that it approximately should give you a constant slope. Right, this is a constant slope in accumulation, constant slope in inversion, and it's the same slope because it's uh, C ox. So that's what's shown here. And then only in between accumulation and inversion is it something different. So you can see the slope actually, uh, it's supposed to kind of, I didn't draw it super accurately, but the slope gets less, sh uh, less steep uh, until you reach inversion again. Okay, so the classic capacitance versus gate voltage curve looks like this. Okay. So, so how can you tell where, which one's inversion, which size inversion? Basically, you see a steep change in the small signal capacitance at threshold. So notice that a steeper, steeper curve here um, versus on this side. Normally, the flat band voltage is negative, right? so the flat band voltage typically is less than zero for an um, NMOS capacitor, so that, that means a P-type silicon substrate. So that's why I'm, I'm drawing like flat band voltage negative. It's close to negative one usually, and the threshold voltage for modern NMOS devices usually is greater than zero. Okay. okay. And C ox, remember, is in farads per centimeter squared. And that's permittivity of the oxide divided by the oxide thickness. Okay, so we're just going to, the hard part today is really just explaining what happens in this middle section. Hopefully it's not too hard <laughs> to get to see that, you know, you have the oxide capacitance for accumulation and inversion. But just to understand physically what's going on, in accumulation, if you increase the, if you're changing the, let's say if you're making the gate voltage more negative, that means you're adding more negative charge on the gate. There has to be more positive charge in the silicon, and that positive charge is going to come from holes, and those holes will be located right at, up against the dielectric interface. So really the plus and minus charge, increments in charge, are being added on either side of the gate dielectric. 
So the effect of small signal capacitance is just the capacitance of the oxide layer. Okay, so that's hopefully a little bit trivial. All right. Okay, now, um, so this is a slight detail. I should increase the gate voltage and look at the gate capacitance. Okay, so it's kind of ideally flat down to the, up to the flat band voltage. Um, but actually at the flat band voltage, you start to see the capacitance come down a little bit. Okay, so it's, it's a relatively small amount. And that's because um, at flat band, there's no charge uh, on average, in, in the no, no charge accumulated at the surface. Okay, so the holes are not really gathered up against the gate dielectric interface. They're actually on average located a slight distance away from the gate dielectric interface. Okay, so I guess I won't draw it on board. But um, so let's say you have your gate terminal here, and then you have your oxide, the silicon dioxide layer here. Um, and let's say there's silicon, and it, you're adding, you're adding and subtracting charge in the silicon a little bit of a distance away from the dielectric interface. Okay, so this little bit of distance is called the Debye length, L sub d. Okay, and it, it's a and last time somebody asked about a screening charge screening effect. Um, this is kind of that effect. Uh, the more heavily doped your semiconductor is, the smaller the Debye length is. But in any case, all you have to remember is just qualitatively, um, at flat band, there's really not, a, there's no strong electric field to attract the holes to the dielectric interface, right? It's flat. There's, if energy band's flat, that means there's no electric field. There's no electric field attracting the, electro, the holes to the surface. So they're going to be, on average, um, being added and subtracted as you change the gate voltage a little bit of a distance away from the gate dielectric interface. And that's L sub D. So the capacitance then, so you're adding plus or you're adding charge, an increment of charge to the gate, and as a result, you have some increment of charge in the silicon, and the separation between those charges that you're adding and subtracting for each, from each side is just the thickness of the gate dielectric and the thickness of the silicon in series, okay? And the thickness of the silicon is L sub D. So it's like adding, so it's like series capacitances. Um, so the, so you basically, this is a series capacitor formula. Um, but it, essentially what all this is saying is that you have um, X naught thickness of silicon dioxide in series with LD thickness of silicon. And the total capacitance is going to be, you know, less than if you only had the oxide by itself. So the, the flat band capacitance is going to be slightly lower, just a very much, you know, it's very slightly lower than the oxide capacitance at the flat band voltage, okay? So you just need to understand this qualitatively. Any questions about this phenomenon qualitatively? Okay, so now once you go to more positive voltage, then you're starting to um, deplete the surface. Okay, so let me sketch it here. So here's your oxide, and you're increasing the gate voltage now above the flat band voltage. So you're going to start to deplete the surface uh, of holes, so you'll end up exposing some ionized acceptors. So let's say you were here, and we increase the gate voltage more, what we're going to do is we're going to deplete further. So that means we're going to expose more negative charge in the silicon to, I mean, so that, that's where the more negative charge comes from when you add more positive charge on the gate. So that's equivalent to sort of adding negative charge at the edge of the depletion region, right? So in that case, you have the oxide in series with silicon, but now the thickness of the silicon is the depletion width, not the Debye length, but now the depletion width. Because you're, as you increase the positive voltage on the gate, you're adding more positive charge you know, at the top surface of the oxide. You're adding more negative charge in the silicon, but essentially you're adding it um, by depleting the silicon more deeply. So that's kind of like adding more negative charge at the depletion depth. Okay? So this small signal capacitor just looks like the thickness of the oxide 
in series with the thickness of that silicon of the depletion width. Okay, the question is, how does the Debye length compare with the depletion width? Um, I guess we could do a quick calculation here. Uh, it, it's, it's much smaller, but we can, you want me to do it very quick? <laughs> we can do it, right, the, this is epsilon is 10 to the minus 12, kt over q is point, you know, 0 0.026, and then na you can pick like 10 to the 17 or something. Um, but it is usually on the order of um, nanometers, I think, depending on the doping concentration. A depletion width, okay, that's a good question. Um, if you're dropping, okay, so 2 phi f. Uh, phi f for, uh, let's say, 10 to the 17, what, what is phi f? Phi f. Part, part two, and so what's two phi f, like 0.84. So let's just say it's one volt, okay. So typically to drop one volt in silicon uh, at, okay, 10 to the 17 doping, what, what's the typical depletion width, if you remember from PN junctions? It's the same. Is it like 100 nanometers, that's right. So 100 nanometers compared to a few nanometers, um, yeah. The by length is much, much um, shorter. So what happens is that once you reach the minimum, the, the maximum depletion depth, the minimum, you'll reach the minimum capacitance here. So usually then this little dip in the, in, in the capacitance, uh, when you go to flat band, is a fraction of this total dip in the um, gate capacitance due to the de depletion width. But yeah, it's maybe like 10 times, on the order of 10 times smaller. Okay, good question. Okay, so, um, the formula for adding two capacitors in series, you, you have to add their inverses and then take the inverse, okay? So this would just be um, X zero, the thickness of the oxide over epsilon ox, and this is going to be, oops, plus, um, so this would be uh, epsilon silicon with a W on top, right? All right. Um, so as you increase the gate voltage above the flat band voltage, you'll deplete further and further, and so W will increase, and so the capacitance will decrease. And then the, the mac, you'll, then you'll reach a maximum depletion depth, and I, I figured I wouldn't be able to write this neatly, so I pre-wrote it on the slide. So uh, once you meet, once you form a strong, a high concentration of electrons at the surface, um, Okay, there's two cases here. But anyway, look, so let me ask first, are there any questions about the depletion capacitance or the capacitance of the, the total MOS capacitance, small signal capacitance in the depletion regime of operation? No? Okay. All right, so this is, a, okay, this is a point of um, possible confusion. Okay, there's two cases in inversion. Uh, so basically, once you make the surface of the silicon pretty much heavily n-type, uh, you can further increase the gate voltage and increase the concentration of electrons at the surface, or you can deplete the, sur the silicon more deeply. So the question, so the question is, th there are two cases here. So which one is actually the one, the, the one that's um, relevant? Well, it actually depends, okay. So there's two cases. So let's say case one, let's assume that electrons can easily be supplied to the p-type silicon somehow, okay? In that case, if there is a ready source of electrons, mobile uh, negative charge, then as you increase the voltage on the gate, in other words, you're adding positive, small positive incremental voltage to the gate, charge to the gate, um, you can actually, uh, um, you, you will induce incremental negative charge in the silicon and that will be coming from electrons, which are mobile, so they'll be attracted to the oxide interface. So, so basically, you'll be adding, subtracting charge of opposite signs, um, basically across the oxide. So the capacitance then, the small signal capacitance is just going to be the capacitance of the oxide layer, okay? Now, on the last two slides in this, is, uh, in this lecture, um, I derived for you basically uh, how long does it take to, to, gen to actually generate the charge needed, this delta, minus delta Q in the silicon. And it turns out it's, um, 
depending on the doping, it depends on the dopant concentration, and it depends on the average minority carrier lifetime. Okay, so if they're at the interface, if there are a lot of traps or defects, you can generate electron hole pairs uh, uh, more rapidly. So then electrons, you know, minority carrier electrons can be generated quickly enough um, to supply this negative delta Q. Okay, so the, the time required to, to, to generate the required minus delta Q depends on your know, minority carrier lifetime. So the shorter, the shorter the lifetime, the faster you can generate electron hole pairs. That's good. Um, it depends on Na. Okay. So, let, let, so let's let, let me explain. Um, so at the let's let's review. What does the energy band diagram look like? Uh, you have negative charge on the gate, uh, negative voltage on the gate. So you're sort of you know, doing this. You're you're bending the bands down like this. So basically, you're bending the bands down to make the surface n-type, right? While this, the, for the body, the bulk is p-type. Okay. So the question is, <coughs> what will happen if you generate an electron hole pair out here? Let's say there's an electron hole pair generated out there. Are they going? Is it? Is that going to lead to electrons? At this, at the oxide interface. Yes, it's just yes or no. <laughs> the, they'll probably recombine um, because uh, you you have electrons and holes generated, and they're wandering just randomly, you know, moving around due to thermal energy, and they'll likely they'll recombine uh, after a while. Basically, you have to generate an electron hole pair in the depletion region, right? So if you generate an electron hole pair in the depletion region. Then there'll be an electric field, and the electron will then want to move to the surface. Right? So in other words, only the electrons that are generated within the depletion region are going to be able to supply the extra negative charge that you want at the surface when you increase the gate voltage. Okay. And how does the width of the depletion region depend on the dopant concentration? Inversely. So if you have more heavily doped silicon, then the depletion width is smaller. And so you have less volume in which you're generating electrons that can contribute to the charge. So if you have less volume to generate electrons to contribute to this you know, negative charge at the surface, it'll take you more time to generate the electrons to, you know, to respond to the change in gate voltage. Okay, so just qualitatively, hopefully it, it makes sense that the more heavily doped the substrate is p-type, the narrower the depletion region width, the, the smaller the volume in which you're be are going to be able to collect minority carriers. And then uh, it's inversely proportional to Ni. So what, why does that make sense? If, if you have um, high intrinsic carrier concentration, then it'll be easier, uh, if you have shorter time needed to build up that inversion layer charge. Why, why does that make sense? Usually, what, what does that say about the band gap energy? If Ni is larger, Band gap energy is smaller, so it's easier, or you, you generate electron hole pairs, or you have a higher generation rate, or something. Right? It's easier to generate electron hole pairs. So then the time required to generate those minority carrier electrons to go to the surface is shorter. Okay? So just qualitatively, it'd be good to sort of see that that makes sense. Now, typically, the average uh, minority carrier lifetime is anywhere from a nanosecond at best to, I mean, that's like pretty bad <laughs> material, to microsecond or even millisecond. So if you plug in some typical numbers here, you'll find that the time required to build that inversion layer charge is many seconds. It's you know, certainly more than a tenth of a second. So remember, I mentioned we're stepping the gate voltage slowly, like a tenth of a volt per second or so. Anyway, so basically, usually thermal generation is not fast enough to respond to um, even to, to certainly not to res can't even respond to the uh, AC signal. Okay, so if you're increasing the gate voltage just a little bit, so remember these changes in in voltage. This is due to the, due to that AC voltage signal. 
right? This is a small signal. Okay, so the AC, oh, shoot, forgot to mention. Typical, <laughs> typical frequencies, uh, so this is uh, usually like one kilohertz to one megahertz. Okay, yeah, sorry, I forgot to mention that. So the AC voltage, so the, it's a small signal, but it's also typically in that um, frequency range. Okay, so it goes up and down like a thousand times minimum per second. So basically, you're not going to have enough time for the generation to, you know, uh, re to produce enough electrons here uh, in, in time to respond to the AC voltage signal. Okay, so, so usually what we see here, case one is not the case if you have just a p-type silicon substrate. Yes, Ali? Okay, good question. Um, so the question, the two-part question is, where does this factor two come from? And for that, I have to I'll refer you to the last two slides in the lecture, <laughs> where I derive in detail um, the, the, this uh, characteristic time constant. Um, the other question is, okay, if you have an, well, okay, so this is a this is already an n-type um, gate material that we usually assume for a p-type silicon substrate. So the electric field is already small. Okay, so let's say for some reason you have some even smaller gate work function material, so the total amount of energy band bending is less. So let's, okay, I'm just gonna draw um, a hypothetical. So let's say at threshold, maybe for some whatever reason, let's say you have a more lightly doped semi, I mean at threshold you don't have as much band bending or something like this, right? Um, so the, the vertical electric field is is smaller, so it takes more time for electrons to move to the surface to respond. So yeah, that that could, that could also. Oh, okay. So your question is, does it take time for the charge in the in the in the gate to build up? Okay. Um, okay. <clears throat> So if you look at it, MOS capacitor. Um, so the question is, this is N plus silicon, this is P-type silicon, and there's you know, oxide in between. Uh, does it, is there actually some time needed to move carriers into and out of the metal gate? So it's uh, very, he very heavily doped. So we assume there's an ohmic contact uh, to the gate, even if it's heavily doped polysilicon um, versus a metal. So we assume that carriers can easily move very quickly in and to and out of the gate. That that's not going to limit the, the the speed at which charges are accumulating on either side of the oxide. That's good questions. Okay, so the realistic case, if you have only a p-type substrate, is that the inversion layer charge density cannot be generated um, quickly enough to keep up with the uh, AC voltage signal. So in that case. Okay, you have the inversion layer charge density, that's great, but that's not gonna change as you apply an AC signal. What the only, the only way then, if you're adding some positive charge to the gate with the AC signal, you need to apply ne to somehow induce equal and opposite charge in the semiconductor. And the only way to do that is to widen the depletion region um, to add the negative charge. Okay, so. How do we widen the depletion region? Let's say, okay, I, I'm adding electro negative charge here. Oops, shoot, okay. Let's say <laughs> I'm, okay, adding positive charge here. So that means I'm taking away, I'm taking away electrons from the gate. So that means I have to take away holes from the substrate. Now, this is a metal contact to P-type silicon it's a majority carrier contact, so holes can easily move into and out of the silicon. So, so this negative Q in the in the semiconductor, by you know, by we can quickly increase the depletion width or decrease it in response to the AC voltage, because it's very easy to quickly move electrons. I mean, there's the ready supply of holes to move in and out of the metal contact. 
Okay? It's just that there's not a ready supply of minority carriers. I mean, the minority carrier concentration is ordinarily very low, and to have significant numbers of them, it takes time to generate them. Okay? So just keep in mind that majority carriers can respond very quickly. There are plenty of them to be supplied. It's the minority carriers that take time to be generated or to die out. Okay, so in this case, uh, ideally then you're adding and subtracting charge, okay, positive and minus charge. The distance between plus the plus Q and minus Q increments is equal to the oxide thickness and the plus the depletion width uh, of the silicon. But it's two different materials, so basically you just, it's, you know, a capacitor whose dielectric comprises, you know, oxide and silicon, and to get the formula is just the same thing. It's just one over C, you add the inverses, one over C ox plus one over C depletion, you take the inverse to get the gate capacitance. And, and then the depletion capacitance, you just um, use the width of the depletion region, the maximum width of the depletion region at threshold. Okay? So that turns out then to be the minimum Let's see, so this is the V, yeah. So, so your ca gate capacitance versus gate voltage curve, you dip down a little bit at flat band, and then you'll end up coming down and reaching a minimum value at the threshold voltage. Okay, so this is the small signal capacitance curve if you don't have a ready source of electrons available to, for the P-type silicon. All right, now, how do we actually, um, so let's look at case one and case two. Okay, case two is what we just went over. In a, in a transistor, you have a gate, you know, MOS, uh, the heart of the transistor is an MOS capacitor, and on either side of the gate, you have conductive, heavily doped regions that are N-type, and so when you apply a gate voltage greater than the threshold voltage, you form an inversion layer of electrons at the surface, so you actually end up with an N-type path between the two n-type source and drain regions. So now this transistor is turned on. So whenever the gate voltage is higher than the threshold voltage, you actually have a, on, a transistor that is conducting current. Okay, so that's how you turn on a transistor. Okay, but in a transistor you have these heavily doped n-type regions, so they can actually easily supply electrons laterally to and from the inversion region at the surface. So this case one where electrons can the inversion charge can respond to the small signal voltage. That really is primarily only the case if you have a transistor structure. Okay? So, in this case, we have the gate voltage, gate capacitance, CV curve will look like this, and it'll come back up. Okay, that's, that's this case. Over here, we have the, if you plot the gate capacitance versus gate voltage, it stays down, okay? Does that, qualitatively, hopefully that makes sense? Okay. Okay, so majority carriers can be easily supplied through the, the P-type silicon substrate contact. Okay, so the hard part is minority carriers. So if you don't have these N plus regions nearby to supply electrons, you have to wait for thermal generation to occur, and that takes many seconds usually. Um, and so that's usually, it's not gonna be fast enough to generate minority carriers to respond to the AC signal. So then you the only way you can s respond to a, like a slight positive increase in gate voltage is to have more deeply depleted, slight, you know, slightly more de deeply depleted silicon. And you can do that by moving holes out of the substrate. But it's easy to move holes into and out of the substrate because it's a majority carrier. Okay, so here's a summary. Um, two cases. Let's see. So at high frequency, if you have just an MOS capacitor with no M plus regions, it's just going to flatten out and stay approximately level above the threshold voltage. If you have a transistor, so you have N plus regions. Okay, so here's an M, uh, M MOS transistor, N plus, N plus, right? If you have this kind of a structure, then um, you, once you reach the threshold, the surface, um, the surface potential is such that electrons like to gather at the surface, 
And if you can supply electrons into and out of the surface region very quickly, then you basically will see only the gate capacitance, right? Because you're adding charge and subtracting charge like only one oxide thickness away from each other. Okay? Um, there's something called the quasi-static. Okay. So this, this gray curve where the gate capacitance comes back up is often called the quasi-static CV measurement or, or quasi-static CV curve. So let me just explain that briefly. Um, so as, I, as, as is stated right here, we can obtain this curve by slowly ramping the gate voltage. Okay. So in other words, if we ramp the gate voltage really slowly so we have enough time for the minority carriers to be generated or to die out as you change the gate voltage, um, then we actually can um, see this actual curve. Okay. Let me just see what notes I have. So first of all, um, so the, the way we measure this is that you have a, um, a voltage source that you ramp slowly. Oh, here we go. Okay, so you're basically ramp, okay, let me highlight this. So you, you ramp the gate voltage, and then you have a very sensitive ammeter to measure the displacement current, the gate voltage, uh, the gate current. And then from this ratio of measured displacement current divided by the, you know, the voltage ramp rate, you can determine the gate capacitance. Okay. Um, now this used to be very useful um, like a couple of decades ago. And I'll explain, <laughs> explain why. So this is, this is useful. Actually, it still can be used for X not greater than about five nanometers. Okay. So let me explain how this works. So what we do is we apply a voltage out here. So we start here. Ah. Somewhere, okay. <laughs> so we start here. If I can get this thing, what is going on? So we start in, in inversion bias. Okay, so we start start out here. Let's just say we start here. Um, so we shine light. What you can do is you have your, your silicon wafer, you have a probe coming down to apply a voltage to the gate. You shine light on your capacitor. Okay? And you shine light until the, the capacitance on your meter uh, shows some maximum capacitance, uh, oxide capacitance. Okay. So why would we want to shine light on the oxide, on the, on the capacitor to start this measurement? What happens when we shine light on a semiconductor? Generate electron hole pairs, right? So the whole point here is we want to, because it takes a long time to form the inversion layer. Um, it takes less time to get the inversion layer to go away. So Basically, we, we start in inversion, under inversion bias, shine light to generate the um, inversion layer. Okay. So once we see the capacitance on the meter stabilized, then we start slowly ramping the voltage down okay, towards accumulation. So then this CV meter can actually trace out this curve. Uh, roughly, it'll look like, like this. Okay. Now, why did I say this is useful for characterizing the gate capacitance only if the gate oxide is uh, not too thin? Remember, all that the meter is measuring is the gate current. If the oxide is physically too thin, then you'll get like quantum mechanical tunneling through it. Um, so basically, you'll get DC current just due to quantum mechanical tunneling through the oxide. And that current is not due to, you know, the displacement current, adding and subtracting charge on either side of the oxide. It's just the DC current. So basically, you want this, this quasi-static um, measurement approach 
assuming that there's no DC current flowing. That the only current that you're measuring with the meter is due to displacement current. Okay? And so um, like 20 years ago, the oxide thicknesses used in CMOS technology um, were about that thick. Okay, nowadays, it's more like a nanometer thick, so the oxides are too leaky. So in practice, then we, don't, we can't make this kind of a easy measurement to characterize the capacitance versus um, voltage. Now, a question would be, well, why would we make this kind of a measurement? Um, so you might not, we won't be able to fully explain this until we cover transistors, but it's a good way to, uh, when you manufacture a CMOS product, you know, they're on a wafer, there are many dyes, a lot of times there are certain dyes, well actually, to save space, um, you know, it, you, you have many dyes on a wafer and you, you cut them up, right, you dice up the wafer to make little IC products. And so you need to have some room, you know, in between the dyes to cut, to make the cut. Okay, so what happens is usually in those scribe lines, those, those areas in between the dyes, you have some simple test devices like capacitors or transistors. And during the manufacturing process, you can make electrical measurements just to check, okay, did anything go wrong in the manufacturing process? Because there are hundreds of steps in the manufacturing process and something could go wrong. Maybe the oxide thickness was wrong or your doping concentration is wrong. And you, so you can do a quick check. Okay, is the threshold voltage of your device, you know, just check, is it, is it the correct value? Um, is the oxide capacitance, is the oxide thickness correct? You can determine that by measuring C-ox, right? So, so CV measurements are very basic measurement that's always done by the industry just to characterize or to monitor your manufacturing process. Okay? Is there a quasi-static Well, quasi-static is kind of slow. <laughs> Um, well, actually, uh, yeah, so usually we do this on, on, on transistors, right? So um, on transistor structures that we treat as capacitors. So then you can actually scan the voltage pretty quickly, you know, like in if, you know, one second or something and just quickly check the threshold voltage and the oxide capacitance to make sure that everything's set. Yeah. Okay, so this is, yeah, a very basic study. Um, Later when we talk about the uh, transistor, you know, the amount of current, so the threshold voltage tells you at what voltage you turn on the transistor. And that's important, you know, for a circuit designer, like you wanna know that your transistor is turning on properly. But the oxide capacitance also determines something else, the Q inversion, did I? Okay, well, let's, let's do this. Right, this Q inversion. So remember, the inversion charge density, the amount of electrons you have per unit area in the channel, that de is determined by the oxide capacitance, aerial oxide capacitance, as well as the threshold voltage. And the, the amount of current that your transistor can conduct when it's on is directly proportional to Q inversion. Right? The more electrons you have at the surface, the more conductive your surface channel is, the more current your transistor will conduct, the faster your circuit will work. So it's important to keep track of both VT and CX in your manufacturing process. Okay. Okay, so let's go through just a few examples to finish off today's lecture. It's getting hot in here. Okay. Uh, yeah, so just a few examples. Um, like these are typical questions you might see on a quiz or final exam, you know, or something like that. Oh, one, one final little detail. Um, Okay, what happens if like, uh, we actually scan, uh, let's say we start, let, let's say we do a normal CV measurement. So we s step the gate, the gate voltage, the DC gate voltage, and apply a small signal uh, like this. And this is the, um, just a P-type substrate, not a transistor. So let's say we scan the, the DC voltage too quickly, even for the, um, the thermal generation to keep up with the, the, the rate at which the VG is changing. Okay, so this is different than the AC voltage. We know we can't keep up with the AC voltage, but if we step the gate voltage slowly, hopefully the inversion layer charge can build up as needed to match the DC gate voltage. Now, if we ramp the DC, that, that, the, the, the supply voltage too quickly, we actually might not be able to generate the, the inversion layer charge density fast enough. And so we'll end up having to get, as we increase the gate voltage, we're going to have to deplete the silicon more deeply than the maximum depletion depth, you know, that, that threshold depletion depth. And so since the, the silicon is depleted more deeply, 
then that's like a thicker dielectric of silicon. So the capacitance, the small signal capacitance will go down below the so-called minimum voltage, uh, uh, minimum capacitance. Okay, so remember C min is equal to, okay, so it's like 1 over C ox plus, um, so this is, this is the depletion capacitance, 1 over this, you know, inverse, okay? That's C min. So if you, if you step that DC gate voltage too quickly, you're not going to have in, enough inversion charge to build up. Um, and so you end up deep, deeply, this is what we call deeply, or deep depletion. So we're going to deeply deplete the silicon. Okay, but so what happens, yeah, so eventually if you continue to um, increase the gate voltage be well beyond the threshold voltage like that, eventually this will come up in, in reality as you scan the gate voltage. Because over time, right, over a, f a few seconds, you eventually will be able to generate inversion layer due to thermal, gen th thermal generation of electron hole pairs. And eventually this curve will come back up to C min. Okay. So this is some non-ideal behavior that you could see if you're, you're trying to like quickly measure your capacitance versus gate voltage and you don't have a proper transistor, um, you'll see this deep depletion occur. Okay. Um, so one, one, the only reason, well, one reason why I'm mentioning this is because Another way to characterize the, the quality of your manufacturing process is to see how long does it take. So let's say you purposely bias your capacitor. Okay, it's not a transistor. You purposely bias capacitor out here so that deep depletion occurs. And then you, you see how long does it take. You just like hold it out here. How many seconds does it take for this capacitance, this small signal capacitance, to come back up to this minimum level? Okay, that gives you an interesting well, that gives you some information. What information would that kind of a C versus T, capacitance versus time measurement, what kind of information would that give you? Hmm? Mobility, not quite. Not, not, not quite. Um, it gives you this, right? Gives you an idea how long does it take for you to generate the inversion layer charge to, you know. Um, and usually, the, the shorter the minority carrier lifetime is kind of like, that means the more defective or, yeah, more defective your silicon is, especially at the surface. So a lot of times, we actually like to have a long T knot, a long minority carrier lifetime. And so the capacitance versus time measurement um, actually can give us, help us monitor, you know, to, just to make sure that there's not some contamination occurring in the manufacturing process to cause the minority carrier lifetime to suddenly be you know, orders of magnitude shorter than what we normally expect. Okay? Okay. Um, so we've covered everything now for p-type silicon substrate. Let me just briefly mention what, what happens when you have an n-type silicon substrate. So usually the gate material is p plus polysilicon or some higher work function gate, metallic gate material. Okay, so there's always going to be some gate work function, dif uh, work function difference between the gate and the semiconductor. And it's usually the magnitude is close to the band gap energy. Okay, okay, so, so phi m minus phi s is going to be greater than zero. So that's, you know, sort of that's why the flat band voltage is greater than zero here. Okay, so now this is n type silicon. So we have to go. Okay, if we have pos more positive voltage than the flat band, that means we have more positive charge in the gate. That means we ha we're going to be attracting negative charge in the silicon. And there's plenty of negatively charged mobile, mobile carriers in the silicon. So basically, you have electrons coming up to the surface, and you'll just see the oxide capacitance, right? So electrons will be added right at the oxide surface. So you just see the oxide capacitance. Now, if you increase, uh, if you decrease the gate voltage more negative than the flat band voltage, then you're going to repel holes, I mean electrons from the surface. Right? You're going to repel majority carriers from the surface. Capacitance, so charge is going to be added um, at the edge of the depletion region. Okay, so so essentially you have a thicker and thicker dielectric of your capacitance. So that's why the capacitance comes down. Once you reach the threshold voltage, where the surface becomes 
just as much p-type as the body, the body is n-type, then you have two cases. Either you have a ready source of, car of minority carrier holes, so the capacitance jumps back up like this. So that's the case of a MOS transistor or quasi-static CV measurement. Or um, if, you don't, if you don't have a ready source of minority carriers, you're just going to um, flatten out like this and add incremental negative, um, sorry, positive charge in the silicon um, at the edge of the depletion region. Okay, so it's just a mirror image of the, um, in other words, opposite voltage polarity compared to p-type silicon. Yes, Ali? Oh, shoot. Yes, you're right. <laughs> How did that happen? Okay. So this is inversion. Yes, that's correct. And this is accumulation. Thank you. I have to correct that on my slides. Good point. Okay. Any questions just qualitatively? Okay. So just to summarize, if I show you a CV curve, how can you tell if the substrate is n-type or p-type? So how do you know which side is corresponding to inversion layer forming? Steeper side. That's right, steeper side. Great. Okay, let's do just a couple of examples. Um, let's see. I think I already answered. Anyway, okay. I think the answer is on this slide. Uh, so which of these two cases, the quasi-static case or the high-frequency capacitor case, uh, uh, applies in case one? If you have an MOS capacitor and the measurement frequency, the AC frequency is, AC signal frequency is 10 kilohertz. I don't think there's anything tricky here. Oh yeah. Okay. So this this is a capacitor, so you would just see the capacitor curve. Okay. So what if you have a transistor? Which curve are you going to see? Quasi-static. Very good. How about an MOS capacitor? And you're ramping the gate voltage so so slowly that that the inversion charge can be generated. Um, yeah. So it'd be quasi-static. And how about? Um, MOS transistor, you ramp the gate voltage really slowly, quasi-static, okay? Because in each of these cases, you can generate the inversion layer quickly enough to keep up with the um, change in voltage. Yes, James. Yeah, so the question is, okay, yeah, so this is like 10 to the minus 4 seconds kind of period. Yeah, so it turns out that it's not only tau, but it's this Na over Ni, right? So amount of time needed, so typically Na is like 10 to the 16, 17, or 18 or something, and Ni is 10 to 10. So you need orders of magnitude more than tau to, to generate the inversion charge density needed. That's a good question. Okay. Um, okay. Okay, now here's a typical quiz or exam question. Um, how would this, okay, so this is a norm, this is tricky, so you gotta pay attention. The normalized capacitance curve, so this is C divided by C ox, right? So notice the maximum is one. Okay, so how would this curve change if you increase the substrate doping? So whenever I ask this on an on a, on a exam, you should look at just three things, the flat band voltage, the threshold voltage, actually it should be four things. You should look at the oxide capacitance, and the, the so the maximum oxide capacitance and the minimum capacitance, and then you should look at the flat band voltage and the threshold voltage. What is the impact of this change on those four parameters? Now, since we're normalizing this plot to C ox, then we don't have to worry about C ox. Okay. All right. So let's just think qualitatively. If we dope the silicon more heavily, how does that change the flat band voltage? is increasing. So that's phi m minus phi s. Does phi s increase or decrease for n-type substrate? This, it increases, right? So flat band voltage will shift more to the left. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> okay. Right, so flat band voltage will shift to the left. 
How about the threshold voltage? Qualitatively, hopefully you should be able to guess. If you have a more heavily doped p-type substrate, are you going to need more or less voltage to invert it to the opposite type? More. Very good. So the threshold voltage will shift to the right. How about the minimum capacitance? So this is more like related to the depletion capacitance, which is equal to permittivity of silicon over WT. Let's just look at this. What, what about the depletion width? As you increase the doping, will that that'll decrease? So C depletion will go up. And what will that do to C min? It'll increase it. That's right. OK, so let's combine all those together, and you'll get some. So then you should be able to plot some plot like loops like this somehow, right? That the threshold voltage is higher, the C min is higher, flat band voltage is more negative. OK? Let's do one more example. Again, it's normalized oxide thickness, so we don't have to worry about changes in the oxide. OK, if you change the oxide thickness, how is that going to change the flat band voltage? It's not. I, not ideal effects, it will, but we're just going to say um, there's no change. OK, yeah, so ideally, there's no, no, uh, the flat band voltage is going to cancel out the, the work function difference between the gate and the substrate. Oxide thickness has nothing to do with the work function of the gate and the, and the silicon. OK, how about the threshold voltage? If you make the oxide thinner, that means more voltage that you apply will be applied across the, oxide, uh, the silicon. Right? If the oxide is thinner, less voltage is wasted across the oxide. So more of the voltage that you apply will appear across the silicon. So does that mean it's easier or harder to invert? Easier. Great. So VT will go down. Um, and then C min, if it's easier to invert, well, OK. To invert, you still have to have 2 phi f built in, I mean, a, volt, a voltage drop across the silicon, right? So C depletion, I don't think, I mean, you still need the to same total amount of band bending to invert the surface, right? So this C depletion doesn't change. But how about C depletion relative to C ox? Remember here, this is a normalized C ox plot. So what matters is how the C, the depletion capacitance compared to the oxide capacitance. It's, if C depletion stays the same, the C oxide, as you thin down the oxide, C ox goes up. OK, so C depletion, relatively speaking, goes down. So C min will therefore go down. Right, so basically, the curve should look something. You'll, you'll reach the minimum at the threshold, the threshold uh, and the minimum will be lower. OK? So that's basically, that's basically it. All right. Have a good weekend. We'll see you next week.